In his Cancer Freedom, a prominent former NBA player known for his outspoken views on human rights and social justice brings a unique and impactful perspective to the ongoing conversation about transgender athletes. I'm gonna go there in just a minute, but I wanna say the conversation about transgender athletes has been happening for a while. We've seen it on the grade school level, the collegiate level, even in some professional uh, sporting arenas like wrestling and MMA where trans women are dominating the sport. People are on different sides of the coin on whether or not this is fair. Now, when we're having conversations about equality, we have to also think about if it's fair for all. And so Cantor weighed in with his opinion. But his perspective was immediately shot down by a number of people. Not only was he his opinion criticized, but he himself was personally criticized on for stuff that didn't have anything to do with the societal topic that he was actually addressing. And it got me to thinking, like, is this cool? Is it cool how quickly we begin to shoot people down when they try to chime into the conversation? And I think the answer for me is no. So in this video, yes, in this video right here, I want to bring clarity around when and why people's perspectives matter on a given topic in hopes to nudge us into like arriving at a normalization of listening to the right people at the right time for the right reasons. Again, I said when people's opinion matter. Does his opinion matter? Who is he? Is he qualified? Let's get into it. Listen, shy speak, shy speak, shy speak, shy speak. Okay, so really, really quickly, let me give you some context. So for context, in his cancer, freedom, gotta say the freedom, uh, he's a professional athlete, so him being a professional athlete allows him to have a wider reach and to contribute to a larger dialogue on inclusivity or in his case, equality in sports. So people want to know at this point, if you do not know, what did he say? Does he agree or does he disagree with being a transgender women being in sports? That's what I want to know. Do you agree or disagree? If you disagree, then you're automatically out. I hate you. You this, this, that, and there. If you agree, I love you. Da, 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 da. Uh, I want us to calm down right here in this video. But whatever views he have, we want to understand why he thinks that. Why is really important. So let's get into what he actually said. I want to share a little bit of the feedback. No, actually, let's share a little bit of the conversation, right? We're going to share some of the conversation. Let's go right here. Our former NBA player Ennis Cantor Freedom is jumping into the debate around trans athletes and women's sports. He says, Men don't belong in women's spaces, restrooms, locker room, sports. Since I'm blackballed from the NBA, should I put on a wig, identify as a woman, and start dominating the WNBA? Uh, he's with us now. Morning to you. I know a lot of that was sarcasm. You would dominate the WNBA, by the way. <laughs> One of the things that was cut right there in the thing is that I know a lot of that was sarcasm. Because sometimes he's being sarcastic. Some people can be being sarcastic, but they can be making a really good point still. So he's like, I mean, some of that is sarcasm. But they go on to actually clear it up. And I say that to say, like, sometimes we don't like how people say it, what they say, but maybe that's just their them being jovial or their way of exchanging their own little banter or their own sarcasm. But does he actually have a point here? Does his remarks matter? Let's chime in. You would. Uh, what, what inspired that, Ennis? I, I don't know if we have heard that from you up until this point. Oh, that's another thing. I don't know if we've heard that from you up until this point, right? Well, People feel like, well, have you ever talked about this before? So if you haven't talked about it before, well, your first time always has to be your first time, right? Like, so like maybe he will talk about women's issues and issues with gender and sport later, but maybe this was just his first time. So let's not shoot people down just because it's their first time, but let's see why. Let's see why. And then we'll be able to determine whether or not his opinion matters. And then, of course, like I said, I'm going to get to um, when it should matter, when we should have listening ears and why. You know, I have been following what's going on. I have been uh, listening to many people. I have been listening to my friends, uh, Riley Gaines, and uh, many other uh, politicians and uh, governors. And this should not even be a debate. Men do not belong in uh, women's spaces. Like I said in my tweet, restrooms, locker rooms, or, or, or sports, you know? So I think, you know, the more male athletes who come out and, and to try to uh, support uh, women's in uh, sport. I've, I've pointed out, and it's not 
Okay, so from his assessment, he's basically saying that he um, seen the conversation going on. He's an athlete, and so he decided to chime in. Now, when we allow different people to enter the conversation, right, we get a different viewpoint. So I've heard people talk about this from kids, for example, maybe an eight-year-old uh, boy and is transgender, transitioning to, to be a young girl. So by the time he's nine years old, he wants to play soccer. And so it's kind of like, well, they're all nine, year old, nine years old. Just let them play, right? But then when you have somebody like uh, Ennis enter the conversation as a male who is seven foot and he is 270 pounds by his own admission, who at some point he was dominant. Now he's not still dominant. Like by the time he got out of the M NBA, he, his, his, you know, he was not up to as up to par as he probably liked to believe, but ultimately he is still in shape. He still works out. There are videos of him doing so. So you say, he says, Hey, what happens if I was to just put on a wig? I want to begin to identify as a woman and then I can just go dominate the WNBA. Like if you really think about that, aside from how he said it and all that, consider it. This person is actually an athlete, right? And so you begin to think like, wow, that, yeah, that would be kind of unfair, right? Or that's, that's a, that's a different way of looking at it, right? And so you begin to get a different perspective. That's what I want people to understand here. We are so quick to be like, oh, matter of fact, let, I want to show y'all what some of the people were saying about him. Just unwarranted, just because he chose to chime into the conversation, people were saying all sorts of mean things to him. So they were like, let's see, um, they're roasting him. Uh, people think he's a good basketball player. Uh, they just dunked on him. I mean, it's just all kinds of stuff. I think somebody, I saw somebody say that he was like, Oh, oh, I don't want to read that too much. But basically, they said something about him being like a right winger and all this kind of stuff. Maybe, maybe he is. I don't know him. I don't follow him. I don't keep up with him. But what I do know is he's an athlete. So here's where we should begin. Uh, this is when we should consider people's perspective, right? When they actually are qualified candidate to speak on it right? Because they have a different vantage point. They're making the same statement that somebody else makes, but it sounds different when they are in that arena. In fact, there was someone else who commented on it, and I actually want to share that too. Um, this person said, uh, here we go. Let's go ahead and let's, let's, let's share it. I'm not, yeah. Say LeBron James uh, changed his gender. You know what I mean? Okay. Can he stay in the NBA or because he's a woman, does he have to go to the WNBA where he will score 840 points a game? 840, I mean, I don't know. Are we trying to be funny? I mean, sometimes, you know, anyway. Basically, the point here is someone else said it, but he's a comedian. He doesn't matter. He's joking, whatever. But if the actual athlete themselves who have taken assessment of it, who walk in those spaces, who are around athletes all the time, if they say, man, this may not actually be the fairest thing to do, we should consider it. I just want people to take that into consideration because at the end of the day, he could be a qualified candidate. I say that he's qualified because he's in sports. He's not just weighing in on the latest technology on what's happening in brain surgery. Why would we care? We don't even need to give you platform. We don't even need to amplify what you're saying at all. He's not weighing in on aerospace engineering uh, innovations and what they should be doing there because he doesn't know anything about that. He's in his wheelhouse. So whether his point is in alignment with right wing or left wing or whatever political view you think, stop being so politically polarized that you're not actually able to listen to somebody who actually has like scope and has 
like ability. He has all the credentials. He has like, you know what I mean? Like he should be here, right? He should be here and we should consider his point. That's all I wanted to say. I'm not trying to say whether I agree or disagree with his point, whether you should agree or disagree with it. But if you take it into consideration, it may actually cause us to come to a final conclusion with what we're going to do about this situation, how we're going to address it in society. I say that because in sports, right, you have an angle. And at first, if you're looking at this from this angle, this one angle that the camera is on, it looked like it was legit. A play was legit. But then they pause it and they go review the camera angle. They switch the angle and then you're like, oh, yeah, that was out of bounds right so maybe you have a perspective and your perspective is from this angle but when you consider it from somebody else's perspective you begin to realize like oh yeah wait a minute right so i just want us to be able to do that but we can't do that if we immediately start roasting people uh considering them invalid they're not invalid if they're in their wheelhouse if they're in their wheelhouse, we want to hear from them. And here's another thing that I like that he said that he was trying to do. If we should listen to people, if they're trying to inspire others to speak up. OK, he said that he asked around his community and his sport and not a lot of people were chiming in on it. And it's going on in sports. And so he figured, well, maybe they don't want to chime in because they are afraid of something. And I just want to warn as well. LGBTQI community, you all want to have a safe space. But there has to be a safe space for people to be able to engage in the conversation as well. People should not be afraid to say what they think about it, especially if they're a qualified candidate. Let's create safe spaces for communication and conversation. And eventually we'll arrive at a more 360 view of the situation and we can come to a better conclusion. At least that's what I think. Now, I hope this video was helpful. I hope you help you understand that people's perspective really does matter, especially when they are, you know, qualified to be there. Um, and also, I hope it helped you to be open to hearing others' side of the topic, even if it disagrees with yours just a little bit, just thinking that maybe they're seeing it from a different camera angle view. And at the end of the day, we could come up with a synergistic, innovative compromise that serves all of us best, right? So do me a favor. I want you to drop me a comment. I want to know what you think about what I'm saying, because it bothers me of how quickly people's ideas are shut down. We don't know when to listen to people and when not. Sometimes we let people who all the way over here in tech talk to us about psychology. Then we, it, Let's get, listen, there are times when people's opinion does matter. So it bothers me. So what do you think about that? Also, this is a safe space. You can tell me what you think about what should happen with the case of trans women in women's sports safe place here. Feel free to drop your notes and I'll see you in the next video. Listen, shy speech, shy speech, shy speech, shy speech. Is it possible to have a peaceful dialogue with someone about a big issue with whom you drastically disagree? In my opinion, the answer is yes. I call those civil conversations. In this video, I'm going to be actually talking about why civil conversations are critical to our society, why we should be having them, who should be having them, et cetera. But first, I got to get into the actual definition of what it means to be civil and have a civil conversation all in all. Let's go. Listen, shy speak, shy speak, shy speak, shy speak. Now, by definition, I'm going to read the definition here. By definition, a civil conversation is a thoughtful, respectful exchange of ideas, opinions, and viewpoints between individuals, often with differing perspectives in matters uh, in a manner that promotes understanding, empathy, and productive outcomes. It ca is categorized by, it's an active form of listening. It's an open-mindedness. It is a willingness to engage in a dialogue without, here's the part, here's the part, without resorting to hostility and aggression. That is what a civil conversation is. Now, I have hmm, at least five compelling reasons why civil conversations are critical to this society. Let's get into it. Ah, I'm so like, <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> we gotta talk about this because people would just be saying anything to each other and next thing you know it's all out of pocket and i just really hope that in my time here on earth that i'm able to foster some civil conversations but more so i want people to embrace this approach Let's 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 get into it. Listen, shy speech, shy speech, shy speech, shy speech. All right, so first and foremost, number one, civil conversations provide a platform for people to share their experiences, beliefs, and concerns. It fosters understanding and empathy. Number two. It promotes tolerance and inclusivity. If you don't like the word tolerance, maybe you will go with the word grace. We all need it. Let's face it, in our world, it's marked by an increasing polarization and divisiveness and all that kind of stuff. So we have to find a way um, to understand that we have a shared humanity with different nuances, different cultures, social and intellectual diversities. Um, our experiences. And so when we embrace those experiences, we have more right diversity there. Like it's just, it's just the richness of diversity is there, but that can't happen if we don't have civil conversation. Civil conversation gives you the opportunity to sit down and have a respectful dialogue with somebody and create a space, right? Where these different diverse voices that I was just talking about are acknowledged, right? This is the beauty of a civil conversation. Number three, I'm gonna keep it moving. And that is, it is essential to resolving conflict constructively. Now, we all know that communication resolves conflict, but civil conversation resolves conflict constructively because you can resolve conflict and it don't necessarily have to be constructive. Ask me how I know. Mm. Okay. But it resolves conflict. You know, if you ever seen two people go at it and you think to yourself, wow, now that was ineffective. Well, civil discourse transforms destructive, you know, confrontation into opportunities for growth and, and resolution by engaging in some type of open dialogue and seeking common ground. Participants can like de-escalate tension. See these words? You got to be able to de-escalate things, but you're doing it. Why? Because civil conversation, the whole point of it is that we're intentionally sitting down here and we've made a co 